Hello guys, how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. So, today we are gonna see, what if Izuku becomes the master of the mystic arts, Deka X May, part 1. So before we start, go check out the author of this fanfic, Mystic Martyr, link is in the description. Also subscribe to our channel, and like this video. So let's begin the video. What's the matter Deku? Bakugo said with a sneer, his voice laced with vehemence, and contempt as he uttered his favorite insult toward the green-haired boy that he tormented so frequently. The explosive blonde stood front and center, his arms crossed, as he glowered down at the corkless boy before him. His entourage of friends, sycophants, really stood behind him, mimicking his posture as best they could, as if they were hoping to capture even a fraction of the charisma and coolness that Bakugo exuded in their eyes. Don't tell me you're scared? Izuku shuddered, as all eyes were on him, he had followed Kaken with an uncanny reverence for years despite the humiliation that was relied upon him day in and day out. But he hated being at the center of attention like this, in front of more condescending glances than usual. It usually meant Kaken was going to degrade him worse than he normally did. It helped that they were in the middle of the woods though, slightly anyway. Izuku knew that at least if he ended up crying which he was apt to do he wouldn't be made a spectacle of in the middle of the park or the schoolyard which is typically where Bakugo revealed in his bullying of him. Still, Midoriya shrunk under the gaze of Bakugo and his gang of followers. He always felt so small, and beneath them all, especially Bakugo. But wasn't that why he always followed after them all followed him in spite of everything? So long as he followed the boy who he always thought was a model case of victory and strength, couldn't he too, a quirkless weakling, become strong as well? I'm not scared. Midoriya stammered in the face of their malicious smirking. His shaking body said otherwise though, and Bakugo knew it. Oh, Bakugo said with a sickeningly sweet tone. Then what are you waiting for? Get to a Deka. Bakugo stomped toward Midoriya, gripping his shoulders and whirling him around before giving his backside a rough shove. Midoriya caught himself before he could face plant into the slick, mossy ground beneath his feet, a loud creaking noise causing him to stare up with trepidation at the looming decrepit mansion rotting forlornly before them. The abandoned mansion was the entire reason Bakugo brought him, and the rest of his gang out into these woods in the first place. Midoriya glanced all over the decaying outer husk of the building, brown, and white paint particles were flaking off unceremoniously. Rotted wooden planks on both the walls and the front porch looked, as if they were forcibly rent and twisted off by turbulent, stormy winds, vines alive, and dead had victoriously covered and consumed huge swaths of the walls and roof, which also had gaping holes in it, and what windows remained looked cracked beyond repair. All the kids in the neighborhood knew it colloquially, as the haunted mansion, and it wasn't uncommon for kids to dare other kids to go inside, and creep around, much to the chagrin of parents, and local authorities alike, who had deemed the building unsafe, and off-limits for years, long before Bakugo, and Midoriya were born, even. You want to do something fun? Izuka thought back to Bakugo's words from earlier. How about we go check out that haunted mansion before the storm hits? A chorus of oohs and us followed, as if Bakugo's suggestion was scandalous. Midoriya went along with it, as did everyone else, but he hadn't picked up on the snickering and the nefarious glances being cast his way as they traipsed through the darkened woods. Now the boy knew. Bakugo waited for a soon-to-be stormy day like this to goad him into exploring the haunted mansion, alone. A sudden drop of precipitation landing on his shoulder rocked Midoriya out of his thoughts. He slowly tilted his head up at the dilapidated building towering above him. He hadn't even entered yet. He was standing on the torn-up porch, hesitating directly in front of the foreboding door. Deka! Bakugo snarled, making the poor boy jump up in fright. Hurry up, or else we'll leave you here in the storm. Bakugo said that last bit with a nasty grin, and Izuku knew better than to call his bluff. Slowly, Midoriya shuffled forward, placing his hands on the great wooden door. If Bakugo and his gang made him feel small, then this huge, rotten building made him feel microscopic. He gave a half-hearted shove, and the door gave little resistance, as it creaked open, much to his surprise. He stepped in, giving a cursory look around the decayed foyer, and the staircase directly in front of him before turning back to the other boys giving them a friendly wave, as newfound courage swept through his body. Bakugo's followers whispered fervently among themselves, surprised that Midoriya hadn't cowered out like they expected. Even Bakugo looked surprised for a second, but said nothing, opting to instead grit his teeth in frustration. A sudden breeze blew through the forest before Midoriya could yell anything out, causing the door to swing shut in his face, causing him to jump back and yell in fright. The slam from the door seemed to shake the entire building, eliciting a slight groan from the structure as dust rained down from the flaking ceiling. Izuka quickly shook himself free from the clinging grime. All right, I'm in, Izuka thought. Now what? Thinking back, 
Bakugo had never explained what exactly he was supposed to do once he entered the mansion. He had only told him to go in. But Midoriya didn't think Bakugo would be really impressed with him if he simply left at this moment. No, he'd at least explore a bit. To say the interior of the building was dark would be an understatement. The two rooms flanking both his left and right side were completely shrouded in darkness, and the foyer had barely any light, as it was Izuka chalked it up the brewing storm outside. The pitter-patter of falling rain was more audible, spurring him toward the stairs. He certainly wasn't going to be left behind if he could help it. With careful steps, Midoriya slowly ascended the stairs to the upper foyer. Its stability was questionable at best, but it still seemed capable enough to support his weight, which he was grateful for. He stuck near the crumbling railing, and inched his way toward a side room. The upper foyer extended all the way to the back of the building, stripped bare of even the most basic decor or furniture. A large circular window crisscrossed with a strange series of arcs seemed to offer a view of the woods behind the house but the impending storm blocked view, and light alike, leaving the second story even more bleak than it was bare. A clap of thunder, and a blinding flash through the window startled Midoriya. He really needed to hurry, but he wanted to make sure Bakugo would be impressed with how long he had stayed inside. Not lingering any longer, Midoriya slipped into the closest side room, promising himself he would leave right after to ensure Bakugo wouldn't leave him behind. The room was more compact and square-shaped, though just as dusty as the rest of the house. The walls were lined entirely with grand bookshelves touching all the way to the ceiling, splintered, and barren of whatever texts they might have been decorated with in the past. Except, wait, what? Izuka blinked, and approached a bookshelf that ended in the far corner of the room. Hiding in the shelf's shadow, and coated beneath a surprisingly thin layer of dust was a single book. Midoriya's curiosity took over, as he reached out to fetch it. He stared at the cover for a good minute before flipping it over, and studying its backside and spine. Midoriya discovered the leather cover of the book was a brilliant shade of red beneath the minute amount of dust covering it. There were no words written on the cover, and when he flipped it open to a random page, he was greeted with lines, and lines of indiscernible text. What language is this? Izuka wondered. It's not Japanese, or even Chinese for that matter. The sound of thunder struck again, this time reverberating through the shelves, and causing the entire room to shake harder than the foyer had just moments prior. Without even thinking, Midoriya slammed the book shut, tucked it under his arm, and bolted out of the room, and down the stairs. The pelting of rain, and the howling wind that accompanied it was louder than ever, and Midoriya felt a surge of panic at the prospect of Bakugo abandoning him here to ride out the storm in the night. He'd certainly have some explaining to do to his mother the following day if that were to happen, provided she didn't die from worry first. Midoriya burst through the door, and nearly yelled out in relief, as he saw Bakugo standing in his exact same spot along with his other friends behind him, though they looked more desperate than their leader to seek shelter from the storm. Bakugo's natural scowl only deepened, as the quirkless loser finally emerged from the house after roughly eight tense minutes. About damn time, shitty Deku. Would you look at that? One of Bakugo's cohorts muttered, as he wrapped his arms and elongated fingers around his torso, shivering in the blustery rain. Quirkless kid went in, and came out just fine. Deku, Bakugo barked. He leveled his glare directly at the poor boy, not looking or feeling impressed in the slightest. In fact, all he felt was frustration that Midoriya had succeeded. We're leaving. Without even waiting for the green-haired lad to respond, Bakugo turned and stormed off, his hands in his pockets, as his followers flocked around behind him. Midoriya wasted no time in bounding across the mossy forest floor now waterlogged from the incessant rain to catch up with the rest of the group. In a few minutes, the group of boys found their way back along the ravine that held the creek they had played around so many times in years prior. They always followed the creek back in the general direction of the park whenever they decided to play out here, but the sight before them made the drenched youths linger and all. The ravine before them no longer held the gentle creek they had seen an hour before, but instead contained a rampaging torrent of rapid floodwaters, filled to the brim with mud and debris and that was just on the surface. The kid with the elongated fingers turned toward Midoriya, noticing the red spine of a book nestled in his armpit. Whoa, Midoriya even managed to sneak something out of the mansion. For the second time that day, Midoriya shrank, as all eyes were on him. It didn't matter that they didn't have looks of contempt on their faces, he was simply conditioned after so many years of bullying to feel uncomfortable, and brace for the worst whenever this happened. The worst, unfortunately, was about to come. Huh, Bakugo growled, pushing the boys that were crowding around Midoriya, and inquiring about his find aside so he could see it for himself. Sure enough, tucked in snugly beneath the boys' arms was a thick, red book. Midoriya was shielding it, as best he could from the rain, but Bakugo saw it, as Midoriya was trying to keep it away from him. Naturally, his anger surged. Well, well, Bakugo spat. I never pegged you to be a thief and a loser, Deku. Midoriya blinked, as the words reverberated inside his head. Thief? And you want to be a hero? Bakugo was sporting his trademark crazed grin now. 
How can you even play the role of a worthless wannabe hero when you steal things like a villain? Midoriya clenched his eyes shut and backed away from the boys, as Bakugo's words stung his brain like a hornet, like a villain like a villain. Immense guilt swelled inside Izuku, as he took another step back from the gang of boys, moving away just as Bakugo was reaching out to grab hold of the book's spine, earning him a murderous glare. Give me the book, Deku! Bakugo growled. He clenched his fists. He might not have been able to use his quirk as effectively in the ring, but he could still throw a hell of a punch. Kakan! Midoriya yelled out in protest, taking another step backwards toward the edge of the ravine. I need to return this. What you need to do is fork that book over. Bakugo growled with even more anger. Was that even possible? Of course it was. Kakan! Whatever protests Midoriya was about to yell were lost, as he felt the earth give way beneath his foot with one final step back. Gravity took full effect as his body tumbled backwards, with the last thing the quirkless boy seeing before submerging into the murky depths below was the look of absolute shock on Bakugo's face. Help! Izuku sputtered desperately as the torrential floodwaters tossed and turned him like a load of laundry. He lost his grip on the book, but he hardly even noticed, as he was flailing his arms wildly trying to keep himself from sinking. He parted his lips the moment his face was met with air, and not water, gasping for breath, as he looked around, beleaguered, and distraught about his predicament. Midoriya whimpered before being pulled back under by the raging current. There was no one to be seen running along the ravine edge. But Kugo and his followers were gone. He was going to die, and he was going to die alone. Something solid and hefty suddenly rammed into his side, knocking what little breath he had out of his lungs, but fortunately also propelling him back to the surface. Midoriya instinctively clung to the object, a log large enough for him to hold onto as he was swept away. He kept his eyes tightly shut, as rain, wind, and muddied water battered his face relentlessly. Midoriya suddenly yelled out in pain. A searing, scratching sensation ran up his right cheek where the pointed tip of an errant branch danced around the raging water sliced across his skin. The hapless boy only clung to his makeshift lifeboat harder, even as the waters began banging the wayward log against what Midoriya could only surmise to be other logs and whatever debris he could imagine. With his eyes clenched shut, the boy could only guess what the chaos swirling around him in the muddied waters looked like. Midoriya sputtered and sobbed as he was tossed so mercilessly down the ravine, but his sobs soon gave way to horrid, blood-curdling screams as his log rammed straight into a derelict tree trunk entrenched in the depths of the river, his hands being pinned and crushed between both splintered, wooden surfaces. In the wake of the blistering pain, Midoriya yanked his eyes wide open as he screamed out, only to be met with a splattering of muddied water to his face. The muck blinded him, and he slipped limply off his log the moment his crushed hands were released from the vice. I'm going to die, Izuka thought hopelessly. I'm going to die, and I'll never become a hero. Now back to being tumbled back, and forth by the unyielding waves, Midoriya could only gurgle out his screams whenever he was plunged back into the murky depths. The final thought that flashed into his mind before losing consciousness was his mother and how heartbroken she'd be whenever his body was recovered. The splashing of a wave stirred him out of the all-consuming darkness. His eyelids cracked open, blinking repeatedly in a vain attempt to clear out the gunk that blurred his vision. Am I alive? Izuka thought weakly, as he swiveled his head around, taking note of his surroundings, as best he could. He was laying on his back, that much he knew. It seemed he had miraculously washed up on the bank of the ravine. Casting his gaze down toward the water, he could see it still churning ferociously, though the rain had lessened a considerable deal. With a grunt, Midoriya tried lifting his body up, but found he had no energy to do so. He tried settling for his arms instead, but winced in pain. A surge of adrenaline was felt, as Midoriya realized he could not even feel his hands, let alone move them. Midoriya coughed and let his head drop back down. His body couldn't even handle that minuscule rush of adrenaline it seemed and he could already feel his consciousness slipping away from him again. That is, until some movement above him caught his blurry eye. Who? He croaked out, but felt his mouth clam up. It came as no shock that he also lacked the energy to even speak. Don't move, a gruff voice replied. Izuka released a sigh he hadn't even realized he was holding at that moment. He strained to get a good look at his savior before everything faded. The only precise details he could make out was a gentlemanly face, a blue tunic, and a flapping, red cloth that gently wrapped around his body coating him in what felt like an otherworldly warmth. Izuku let his eyes flutter shut, as he drifted peacefully to the sensation of being slowly lifted to safety. Darkness and warmth were not typically things Izuku would correlate with one another, yet the waves of warmth that washed over his body, inundating him with a serene sense of calmness, had not waned in the slightest, as he drifted through sleep. The gentleman, the tunic, the red cloak capturing his body in such a gentle embrace those were the last things he saw before darkness once again robbed his senses. Well, his normal senses, anyway, 
Izuka could hardly explain it even, as he was set adrift among the ether of his own unconsciousness, but he could still feel that cloak wrapped loosely around his drenched form, and the comforting heat that seemed to literally pulse out of its fibers, and further beyond the gentle radiance of the cloak was the other sensation he had detected before his mind slipped away, that of being lifted off the sludgy riverbank by the gentleman he had caught a glimpse of. Or was it the cloak? Now that he thought about it, it had seemed like the blue-robed gentleman and the red cloak were almost like two different entities. Did that cloak belong to a second individual? Had someone else besides the gentleman slipped down into the ravine to fetch his exhausted body without Izuka even noticing them or their features? A sudden shift in sensations forced Izuka to file that thought away for the time being. The shift rippled all through the darkness he was floating in what was happening. The feeling of being lifted had ceased and now he was sinking? The last thing he had felt against his backside before the heat was the slick mud of the riverbank. But now his back was being pressed against what had to be a cushion of some kind. He was sinking into it, but not to the point where Izuka feared falling into it entirely. And speaking of the heat of the cloak that had undoubtedly saved him that, too, had dissipated. Izuka despaired, and imagined himself reaching out into the abyss, hoping that it was not totally beyond his grasp, but there was no vestige of heat left to be felt, and then stirring. And Izuka finally opened his eyes. Beep, beep, beep. Where there was once a safe cocoon of darkness surrounding him, Izuka now found himself blinking helplessly beneath a white light, blinding, intense, and invasive. What? Izuka thought, as his eyes reoriented themselves, his vision no longer obstructed by the muddied muck of the river. Where am I? The glare of the light faded, as his eyes became more adjusted with each blink. He was in a hospital room. The white walls, ceiling, floor, and bed were probably what made the light of the room so initially blinding. Beep, beep, beep. Izuka tilted his head toward the sound. An EKG monitor was to the right of his bed, beeping in tandem with his pulse, causing Izuka to be grimly aware of the wires and tubes connected to his body. Thankfully, his mouth was clear. A television was mounted on the wall before him, and a few posters of doctors and health-related phrases dotted the walls here and there. It didn't make the room seem any less blindingly white though. So you awake at last. Izuka nearly jolted at the gruff voice that spoke to his left. Wait, that voice. Izuka snapped his head in the voice's direction, eyes widening in shock at the man that sat beside him. Blue tunic, red cloak draped over the hospital chair, the meticulously trimmed goatee, the combed, well-kept hair this was without a doubt the man he had seen after washing up on the riverbank. You saved me, Izuka sputtered, as he tried sitting up in his bed though his body's muscles protested with great pain, and a well of newfound tears threatened to spill forth. The gentleman was up in an instant, placing his palm against Izuka's chest, and gently nudging him to lie back down. When his backside pressed against the cushion of his hospital bed, Izuka realized that this must have been the sensation of the soft sinking one he felt before waking up. Yes, I did save you, young man, the stranger said after ensuring Izuka was placed back into a fully resting position. His lips became taut, and his eyes took on a studious yet grim look as if he was observing the green-haired boy, but was crestfallen by what he saw. Though I'm afraid I did not save you in time. Izuka's breath got caught in his throat, and the monitor beside him began beeping a bit more rapidly. Beep beep, beep beep, beep beep. What do you mean? Izuka managed to rasp out before descending into a harsh coughing fit, turning his head away from the man who had saved him. When Izuka turned back, the strange man had a piping hot cup in his palm before him. The vapors wafted across Izuka's face, tickling his nostrils before he took the hint and parted his lips for the steaming liquid that the man was offering him. Izuka couldn't decide which was worse, the burning heat of the drink or its goddamn saltiness. Much to his relief, however, the man only offered a sip out of the diminutive cup before pulling it away. His taut lips loosened into something akin to a forlorn smile, as Izuka struggled to keep himself from spitting the salty concoction all over his clean, white hospital sheets. Butter tea, the man said, as he set the cup down on a small table nestled in between Izuka's bed and the chair he was sitting in. The table, Izuka noted, had a sizable stack of what could only be get well cards, and a second teacup, filled with the same brew he had just been subjected to. The heat, and the salt combined will help keep your throat clear of mucus. I won't give you too much. No need for you to follow to dehydration when you've already almost drowned. Midoriya blinked, and nodded his head numbly before turning his attention toward the stack of cards resting beside the butter tea. The gentleman followed his gaze to the cards and seemed more than willing to push their conversation along. Ah, uh, yes, you've received quite a few of these, the man said, picking up a pink-colored one and holding it open in front of Izuka's face for him to read, much to the boy's confusion, though he said nothing as he perused the card. It was very monotonous and bland, with a generic get well soon scribbled in the middle of the card with a nearly incomprehensible name signed on the bottom. Izuka recognized it as a student from his class, 
though why they would send him a get well card was beyond him. No one even gave him a passing glance besides Bakugo and his ilk. Izuku shuddered and felt his gut sink in, as if it had been punched at the mere thought of Bakugo. Memories of his recent ordeal began flashing through his mind and the most terrifying realization that had come to Izuku when he was being battered by waves and logs alike was not just that he believed he was going to die he truly thought he was going to die alone, abandoned by the boy he had so reverentially followed for so long. The man flipped through card after card for Izuku to look through. All of them were the same, bland, repetitive colors, generic wording, lazily written signatures. Izuku was sure by this point that the cards weren't made willingly, that they'd been crafted by the order of his homeroom teacher. Adding further insult to injury was the fact that in that whole stack, there was not a single card from Bakugo. Izuka visibly winced. Maybe Bakugo really had left him for dead. Maybe he really didn't care if Deku had died. I'm grateful for what you've done for me, sir, Izuka said, a feeling of exhaustion swirling in his stomach. But you don't have to feed me tea or hold the cards up for me. Izuka tried raising his arms to push the empty gesture that was his classmate's card away from him. And then he froze. My hands! Izuka had a terrified expression etched on his face as he gaped at his thickly bandaged hands resting atop the covers. How had he not noticed this earlier? Was he still that exhausted? Izuka grunted, as he tried flexing his hands beneath the layers of gauze covering them, but it was no use. He felt pain, as he tried lifting his arms, but his hands? He had hardly any feeling in either of them. He shakily turned his head back toward his savior, his wide eyes seeking desperately for an explanation. But the grim, taut face returned to the blue-robed gentleman, as he sat back down, and stared at the boy's ruined hands dismally. There was a glint of empathy in the man's eyes, as if he understood Izuku's predicament all too well. I'm afraid I did not save you in time. The words rang clearly in the boy's head, as the realization dawned on Izuku that this must have been what the gentleman was referring to. His hands were beyond any hope of repair, young man. All he got in response was a whimper from the boy. The gentleman grimaced, furrowing his admittedly stern-looking brow, as a series of shakes and hiccups overtook the child in question gazing disconsolately upon his broken hands. Izuku, a high-pitched cry reverberated through the room, snapping the two of them out of whatever musings they were stuck in, as a homely-looking woman barged through the door and flung herself at the bedridden boy, sobbing uncontrollably. The boy's mother, no doubt, the man thought, as he looked on, watching the boy resting limply in his mother's grasp, his eyes looking more and more drained by the second. After a few racking moments of indecipherable mutterings of concern mixed with a questionably unhealthy amount of sobs, the woman Inko, he believed her name was, based on past visits, finally pulled herself away from her son, who simply laid back lifelessly into his bed without uttering a word toward his mother. You've been out for two whole days, Izuku, Inko cried while wiping away the continuous wave of tears spilling down her cheeks. When I got a call from the doctor that you were beginning to stir, I came right over. Two whole days? Izuku thought blankly, as he processed that information. That would certainly explain the cards from his classmates. Two days would have been more than enough time to hastily put twenty or so cards together and mail them to the hospital. And who might you be? Inko said, sniffling, as she turned her attention toward the man in the blue tunic. The man blinked in surprise before swiftly standing up to give her a courteous bow. My apologies. Where are my manners? I've kept watch over the boy, and I've yet to formally introduce myself. My name is Stephen Strange, the man, Strange said. Dr. Stephen Strange. A doctor? Inko asked with a small smile, feeling slightly more at ease by the display of politeness from Strange. Are you one of the doctors that worked on my son in the emergency room? Alas, no, Strange said with a tone of resignation. I am merely the man who retrieved your son out of the ravine. And oof, Inko had blindsided Strange with a tackling hug, throwing her arms around him as she buried her face into his tunic. He could both feel and hear the waterworks of her tears kicking into action once more right after she had gotten them under control. Two. Thank you, she sobbed. I will never be able to repay you for saving my boy. Strange struggled to keep himself from collapsing under the crushing weight of Inko's hug, but he still managed to work her way back down, or up, from her inconsolable display of grief. Strange gave his tunic a few brushes with his hand after she had calmed down, and tried his hardest to conceal his small grin of amusement at the fact that his garb now sported a noticeable tear stain on it after being subjected to the woman's tear ducts for no more than a minute. I assure you, there's no need to thank me, ma'am. Strange replied graciously. I'll not hear you selling your own actions short, Inko replied sternly. You saved Izuka's life, if you hadn't been there. Izuka merely laid in his bed, as his mother reaped her accolades on Strange's shoulders, who in turn shrugged them off, as humbly as he could. He wasn't listening to their conversation. All of his attention was focused squarely on his hands. His rent, broken, bandaged, lifeless hands. Izuku had always been called weak, and powerless throughout his childhood by others. It had been expected he was quirkless, after all. 
But even though he had suffered through numerous instances of bullying, and beatings, and taunts over the years mostly from Kak and Izuku had never truly felt powerless until the moment he laid eyes on his shattered extremities. So the worthless Deku wants to be a hero, huh? Izuku tried curling his fingers once more, and was dismayed when he could not. Give up on that shitty dream of yours, you corkless loser. He clenched his eyes shut. He didn't want to shed tears uncontrollably like his mother had just moments prior. How could he become a hero without his hands? How could he help people save people like All Might if he couldn't use his hands to lift people up? to hoist, and carry people to safety, to punch villains into the dirt. He was sure Bakugo would one day become one of the greatest heroes of all time, and even had depended on the use of his hands for his quirk. And his doctor said that within another day or two, the bandages could come off permanently. Izuka perked up, as Strange was most definitely talking about his hands. Oh, thank goodness Inko sighed, clasping her hands together. I'll be sure to take him straight home once he's been cleared. And then what? Izuka weakly muttered causing both adults to turn towards him with startled expression. Izuku? Inko whispered worriedly. And then what? Izuku repeated, staring up at them with despondently heartrending eyes. Look at my hands. I can't become a hero after this. Mom. A dumbstruck strange glanced back over to Inko, only to catch her before she could collapse to the ground. Her facial expression looked as if something inside her had visibly cracked and shattered. How can I help people if I can't use my hands? Izuku wailed. The tears he had tried so desperately to keep bottled up finally pouring down his cheeks. The monitor beside him beeping dangerously fast. Strange had barely settled Inko's slumped form down in the chair beside the bed before the door to the hospital room burst open. A small cadre of nurses rushing in to cease the boy's wailing and thrashing, trying their damnedest to get Izuku to compose himself. The boy, to his credit, did not put up much resistance as the nurses successfully restrained him administering medicine to forcibly calm his obviously frayed nerves, as well as checking and documenting all of his vitals. Turning his attention back to Inko, Strange tilted her body back so her head rested against the wall behind her, ensuring she would not slide out of her spot and collapse to the tile floor. Confident the woman was safe where she sat, Strange turned again toward Izuku to monitor the nurses giving him aid. He fully intended on jumping into the fray himself, and administer orders to the cluster of nurses working diligently over the now silent child against his better judgment, though he could recall medical knowledge just as readily as any spell from the Book of Vishanti. And it was not difficult for him to regress to his younger inclinations of being overwhelmingly authoritative given the hospital setting. It's under control, a dull-sounding voice said, as a hand suddenly shot out in front of Strange before he could take another step toward the bed. A rather bedraggled-looking man was standing beside the sorcerer. He wore the garb of a doctor, though Strange would have been hard-pressed to acknowledge him, as such on first impressions alone given the man's grizzled gray hair, loosely fit clothing, and slouchy posture. The man finally turned to face Strange, bright green eyes slowly dissipating back into a lusterless shade of hazel. X-ray eyes, the doctor explained with an unenthusiastic sigh. My quirk lets me skin through organic matter and pick up on any medical anomalies. He raised his hand over his shoulder and lazily bobbed his thumb over in Izuka's direction. He checks out. Just a panic attack. Another sigh. X-ray vision Strange couldn't deny that such a quirk offered priceless utility in a medical profession. But to held by such an unenthusiastic fellow. Too sure, the doctor said. I beg your pardon? Strange replied, snapped out of his musings. My name, the man, Too sure, explained, and simply offered his hand. Dr. Too sure. Strange, the sorcerer said, gripping Tushi's hand only for it to drop back down lifelessly after what had to have been the worst handshake of Strange's life. Dr. Strange. Tushi perked an eyebrow. I figured as much. You were here two days ago, when this boy was brought in. You were giving your recommendations to the other doctors. There was a sarcastic emphasis put around that word, recommendations. That would be the polite way of putting it. Strange thought back to when the doctors were rushing Izuku into the ER. Strange was spouting orders to the men and women around him, who looked at him dumbfounded, but carried out his demands without resistance. It must have been a strange sight indeed, to both doctor and patient alike, to see a man in a blue tunic and a red cloak shouting out precise medical jargon and procedures to everyone around him. Strange knew if Wong was there he'd have told him to be at least a little sheepish about his behavior that day, but strange, stubborn man that he is, couldn't bring himself to regret his abrasive actions. In that instant, Watching that young man suffering from wounds so startlingly similar to those inflicted on him many years ago, Strange felt himself the Surgeon Supreme again instead of the Sorcerer Supreme. Still, it was admirable, Tushir drew on. You know your stuff. Are you sure you want to continue being a pro hero, and not take over my job here? Oh no, you're mistaken, sir, Strange said after a few moments were taken contemplating Tushi's statement. I am not a pro hero. Oh. Tushi's face morphed into one of confusion, 
a step up from his typical lukewarm expression, Strange noted. I had thought you were, considering. Strange saw Tushi's gaze drop down to his admittedly unusual attire, understanding where the confusion was stemming from in an instant. It's complicated, was all that Strange found himself willing to offer his fellow doctor. Right Tushir said with a tone of apprehension before pointing over at Inko's wilted body resting in the corner of the room. And what about her? The boy's mother merely passed out after his fit. Strange explained. She should be fine after some rest. But if you'd like to formally examine her. No thanks. Tushir quickly waved the suggestion away. Less work for me to do. A tap suddenly came against Tushi's shoulder from one of the nurses, indicating that they had finished their work. She handed him a clipboard which he perused with thinly veiled disinterest. Well, that's that. Stabilized and analyzed, Tushir said, handing the clipboard back before speaking to Strange again. Feel free to stay if you wish. Just don't overstay. I don't have to tell you the importance of rest for a patient in his condition. Tushir lazily swiveled toward the door, shooting Izuku a glance as he pushed it open. TCH, importance of rest, Tushir muttered before finally departing for his next chore. I wish I could just lie in bed all day. The nurses bowed before Strange one by one before exiting the room in the same manner. Strange chivalrous, as always returned the courtesy to them. Languid out, Strange muttered under his breath as the last nurse departed, silently thankful that Tushir was not one of the surgeons who had operated on Izuka's hands. Strange was back to Izuka's side, watching the boy now resting peacefully in his bed a far cry from the thrashing sobbing mess he was just a few minutes ago. His eyes lingered on his tear-stained freckles before sliding his gaze down to his bandaged hands. A painful pang of remembrance jolted through Strange's mind. In that instant he saw not Azuka lying in the hospital bed, but himself, despairing over the ruined state of his hands and the ruined state of what was once his prestigious surgical career. I could have done better. Strange thought of that pathetically bitter whimper he had uttered when perusing the work done to save his own hands, work that Strange had, at the time, been convinced was botched and amateurish. Strange shook his head clear of such distasteful memories. He would not pedantically comb over every inch of skin that Azuka's surgeons had worked on. He would simply have faith that the surgeons had done the absolute best they could. Have faith, Strange said quietly to himself, chuckling at the irony of that statement. Where would he be today if he hadn't lacked faith in the aftermath of his operation? His lack of faith helped set him off on a grand naive adventure to right the wrongs of his grievous injuries. Lacking faith is what ultimately led him to Kamartage in his most desperate bid for treatment. Lacking faith is what set him on the path to becoming Sorcerer Supreme. Hmm? Strange felt a twinge of movement and saw one of the bottom tips of his cloak of levitation curl up toward Izuka's face, gently wiping away what remained on his cheeks. You've taken a liking to him, haven't you? Strange asked unabashedly. The enchanted cloak bristled with confirmation before settling back into place lifelessly upon Strange's backside. Strange couldn't help but chuckle again, as have I. Strange connected the tips of his middle and index fingers at an angle curling his thumbs into his palms. The tips of his connected fingers sparked with a radiant orange energy before he briskly drew them apart, downwards, and then together again, drawing a large square shape in the air with his fingertips. When his fingers reconnected, strange magic rushed inward, filling out the empty space of the diagram with energy. There was a bright flash, and a blanket had materialized where the mystical square had once been. Plucking the fluttering fabric out of the air, strange set it loose over Inko's sleeping body letting it settle nicely on top of her. She, being the boy's mother, deserved some comfort in all of this, too. Strange then raised his hands, stretching his left one out, and curling the fingers of his right, circulating them up and down, as his magical energy swirled before him like a vortex. The space then split apart, opening wide to reveal his sleeping quarters in the depths of his sanctum. His portal opened, and Strange prepared to step through and retire for the day when suddenly, how can I help people if I can't use my hands? Izuka's declaration of despair rang through Strange's head, the words giving him pause, as he placed one foot through the portal. Despite what similarities Strange had noted between Izuku and himself, those words highlighted a great difference between the two. Izuka possessed a far more impressively selfless nature than Strange could have hoped to have had when he suffered his injury. Where he had been distraught over the loss of his hands, Strange knew now, and could admit without shame, that what truly destroyed him that day was what that loss represented, his lucrative and wealthy career, built up meticulously over many years of dedicated study and practice, laying to waste in a single day. It was easy for Strange to see and understand the loss that Azuka surely perceived when he gazed down in abject horror at his own broken hands. He had lost the simplest, kindest way to offer help to another person, where the Stephen Strange of the past had viewed his own two hands as little more than tools for maintaining the aggrandizement of arguably the world's greatest surgeon at the time. Izuka viewed his own two hands as the simplest, yet best, way to offer any aid he could spare to others. Strange understood this clearly, and now he understood what he had to do. 
Izuku Midoriya whispered to himself, as he stepped fully through his portal. I failed to rescue you in time, but I refuse to simply stand aside and allow such a pure dream to perish where you lie. Giving the boy one last glance, Strange flicked his fingers in the direction of his sleeping quarters. The two teacups he had placed on the hospital desk suddenly levitated propelled by his unseen magical energy, and darted through the portal right. As it closed, I will give you pity no longer, Izuku, Strange thought, as his eyes slowly adjusted from the bright white of the hospital to the darkness of his sanctum. I will instead offer you what my master offered me all those years ago. He allowed the cloak of levitation to remove itself from his back. Strange wasted no time in retiring for bed to get plenty of rest for tomorrow, a path to follow. Izuku wished he'd gotten plenty of rest for today. When he groggily regained his senses after being restrained by the nurses, nighttime had already arrived. His mother, couched in the same chair as the gentleman that had saved him, greeted him with familiar teary eyes. She looked significantly worn out, though Izuku was lacking a mirror right in that moment, and couldn't imagine himself looking that much better. Sweetie, Inko said tiredly, a nurse came by earlier, but you were still out. Would you like some dinner? I know hospital food can leave much to be desired, but it might not be a bad idea to at least get some food for you. Izuka visibly tensed and jerked his head away, resting his gaze squarely on his still bandaged hands. No, Izuka thought. They've been replaced with clean bandages. Did it happen while he was rendered unconscious by the nurses? It didn't really matter, he'd suppose. He was just grateful to not be awake when they did it. I'm not hungry, Izuka grumbled, turning his face away from his mother's. Inko reached out her lip quivering, as if to say something in protest, but whatever was bubbling just beneath the surface managed to stay there. Inko didn't argue or press the matter any further. They sat in silence, with the sole exception being the beeping from Izuka's EKG monitor, for what felt like an hour. A sound of stirring caught Izuka's attention, forcing him to face his mother again, only to see her standing up and stretching her arms. How long had she sat there watching over me? How long had the gentleman? It's getting late, Inko said, leaning down to plant a motherly kiss on Izuka's forehead, while she glided a hand through the curly green sea of his hair. Dr. Tushar said I can take you home tomorrow so long as you don't have another. She bit her lip, struggling to finish her sentence. Breakdown, Izuka dejectedly thought for her. Unsurprisingly, Inko left her sentence hanging in the air. She cracked the door open slowly almost, as if she was trying to open it, as slowly, as possible, as she gave her son one final forlorn smile for the night. Then she proceeded to close the door at an agonizingly slow pace, as well. The door finally clicked shut. It took another minute before the sound of his mother's footsteps faded down the hall, and Izuka was finally alone. Beep, beep, beep. Not quite alone, he guessed. Midoriya, Dr. Tushur said sluggishly, as he sauntered into the room with a nurse without even looking at his patient. His eyes were glued to whatever data or information was on his clipboard, though he looked at it with equal indifference. I hope you've slept well. Izuka cracked his eyes open in Tushi's direction, hoping the bags beneath his eyelids would speak for themselves. When Tushir finally looked up at him, as if he was actually expecting a verbally given answer, Izuka responded, I slept well. The time on the clock was now 9am Izuka had stayed up for 12 hours straight, fidgeting the night away in his bed. Oh sure, he tried to catch some sleep last night, but sleep was not just elusive, it was non-existent. How was he supposed to get any decent sleep with that damn monitor beeping all goddamn night? Oh, cripes, Izuka thought. I'm starting to think like Kakin now. Good, good. Tushi's voice dripped with apathy. Well, everything seems to be in order, so let's not waste any more time, shall we? I do enough of that clocking in every day. The nurse, a far younger looking woman with long, blazing red hair, bounded forward after that practically skipping toward Izuka's bedside with a saccharine grin plastered across her face from ear to ear. Morning, Izuka, the nurse said, quickly disconnecting the monitor and shutting it off before leaning down closer to Izuku, who had a blanched look smeared on his own face. I'm Nurse Kuchi, and I'm going to help take your bandages off. Would you like that? Dr. Tushir, help me, Izuka screamed in the deep recesses of his own head. Before he could stammer out a protest of any sort, Kuchi puckered her lips and planted a sloppy kiss directly onto Izuku's forehead. What the? Followed by a tingling sensation consuming his whole body that Izuku could have sworn was just a natural reaction. How's my quirk feel? Kuchi giggled. My quirk is called numb people lose all sensation in their bodies for a few minutes whenever I kiss them. For a second I thought I was just. This way you won't feel any pain when I take your bandages off. Kuchi interrupted his thoughts. Not that you should feel any pain, but one can never be too careful. Let's get this over with, Tushir sighed. Layer by layer, the doctor and nurse unraveled the long strips of bandages covering Izuka's hands. The shock and embarrassment from Kuchi's kiss helped to distract him from the slow, gentle procedure. All done, Tushir said dully. Any lingering embarrassment Izuka held over Kuchi's kiss was swiftly swept away by a visceral wave of shame and remorse. Tushir, to his credit, said nothing, 
and looked back at his clipboard, though Izuka couldn't decide whether it was for lack of caring or if he didn't want to seem rude by staring, while Kuchi offered him a sympathetic smile. Hang in there, Izuka and Kuchi said kissing her fingertips before tapping them against his forehead. A simple way to show affection while getting around an obvious drawback of her quirk, Izuka noted. Guess we're done here, Tushir said, tucking the clipboard into his armpit. Your mother already called ahead, she's coming to check you out. Once she's here, and you change out of your hospital clothes, you'll be free to go. Izuka said nothing, but nodded to show that he understood. Tushir grunted, and left without another word, Kuchi following right behind him, but making sure to blow Izuku another kiss before she, too, left. Izuku wanted to say it helped somewhat, but that would have been a filthy lie. Alone once more, Izuka stared at the only thing he wished he could bring himself to not, his superfluous hands scarred far worse than he imagined they would be. They looked absolutely gnarled. Izuka ran his hands over each other, delicately touching the indentations of the scars on both his palms and on the back of his hands even though Kuchi's quirk hadn't worn off yet. Even the squiggles of his knuckles seemed indistinguishable from the rest of the scars. Oh, Izuka blinked, as the numbing sensation suddenly began to fade away, first from his forehead, then spreading down across his body, and then reaching his arms. Izuka audibly gasped, as feeling crept back into his hands, and digits like a hand fitting snugly into a glove for the first time in months. He hadn't possessed any sense of feeling in his hands yesterday, and already he could bend his fingertips and feel the movements. He gingerly ran his hands back over each other again. Maybe this wasn't a complete disaster, he told himself. Maybe I can still use my hands after all, he felt relieved. Maybe I really can still become one. And then the shaking started. At first Izuku was confused. He could still bend his fingers and move his hands. He could still feel all of that. So then why? No, Izuku quietly whimpered as he sat there, watching helplessly, as his hands shook and trembled uncontrollably. No, 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 oh no, no, no. Because that was the real source of his problem now, wasn't it? Sensation returned to his hands, just as he'd hoped. But fate decided to hoard away that which he desperately needed most of all. Control. A scarred hand he could lift. A scarred hand he could flex. A scarred hand he could use. But a scarred hand, trembling uncontrollably. Unable to even properly grasp and lift up the edge of the bed sheet he was lying on. Izuka bit his lip and choked back a sob as he laid his unsteady hands down on the bed sheet. He couldn't bear to lay them directly on his thighs and feel the shakes throughout his whole body. The world seemed determined to strip Izuku of any means possible to become a hero. First, fate robbed him of a quirk. Then it took his hands. What could be next? A cruel reminder of his debilitating condition immediately after he discovered it, apparently. Kuchi swept back into the room with an elongated tray of food, placing it before Izuku by clasping its bottom onto the handlebars on the side of his bed a simple yet nifty method to give patients, mostly relegated to their beds a way to eat food that didn't require getting up or leaning over to a side table. Sausages, a rice bowl, orange slices, a carton of milk it all looked appetizing. Well, as appetizing, as hospital food could be, anyway. Except he couldn't stand to even look at the food, let alone eat any of it. I didn't order any breakfast, Izuka muttered. You didn't, Kuchi said softly, her once bubbly personality now somber, as she looked over Izuka's trembling hands. He wished she wouldn't look at him with such pity. Your mother's down in the lobby, Kuchi continued. She'll be up shortly to help you with this. She demanded that you put some food in you before leaving. And with that, Kuchi left again, but not before blowing him another kiss. Izuka had stopped paying her any attention. Izuka looked back up at the clock, trying to look at anything in the room other than his hands or the food. 9 10 a.m. But the steam from the freshly cooked sausages and rice wafted into his nostrils, enticing him to eat. Izuka's stomach grumbled loudly, and even though Izuka kept telling himself he wasn't in the mood for food, his rumbling gut forced him to turn his attention back to the breakfast spread before him. There was just one problem, though, his hands. Izuka placed his hand over the pair of chopsticks that had come with the rice bowl, grasping at it as best he could. They, too, shook whenever he tried picking them up. They clattered out of his hands, and back on the tray time after time, the lack of results, and progress slowly eating up Izuka's patience, as he failed to grasp and pick up something, as simple, as a pair of chopsticks after dozens of attempts. Damn it all, Izuka angrily cursed under his breath, uncharacteristic of him, as it was. Now the world was just mocking him, of that he was certain. The chopsticks dropped back onto the tray, clattering a final time, as Izuka finally embraced defeat. How many minutes were spent trying to pick them up? And where was his mother? How long did it take to get to his room from the lobby? Izuka glanced back up at the clock. 9, 10 a.m. What? Had the clock broken just now? What were the odds of that? I'd start with the sausages if I were you. A familiar, but no less startling gentlemanly voice spoke to the left of Izuku, causing the poor boy to jolt and thrash around to see the source of the voice, knocking the tray loose from the handlebars in the process and sending the food 
and milk splattering to the tile below. The tray rattled around the floor before eventually coming to a halt, leaving Izuka shocked panting as the only audible sound left in the room. He stared wide-eyed at the figure with the same colored blue tunic, red cloak, and well-trimmed face as yesterday. Dr. Strange, Izuka painted. You seem surprised to see me, Midoriya. Strange replied from his seat the same chair he had been sitting in yesterday, as well. I didn't Izuka stammered. How long have you been there? Did you not hear me come in? Strange responded inquisitively, his eyebrow perked. I didn't even see you come in, Izuka said, feeling as exasperated as he was hungry. Interesting, said Strange, as if such a logical response was something to muse over, as he looked down at the mess on the floor. I apologize for ruining your meal. Allow me to fix that. Strange placed his hands together, curling his pinkies and thumbs into his palms. His index fingers were pointing straight up while his middle and ring fingers connected with each other, forming a rhombus-like shape. Izuku watched the scene curiously. What was the doctor going to do? Strange then slid his hands past each other while maintaining the positions of his fingers. A rumbling hum caused Izuku to blink in confusion. The room rumbled? What was happening? He glanced back over to the doctor. And was he wearing that amulet yesterday? Draped from his neck was a shimmering amulet, opening like a golden eye, and revealing a radiant green light from within. Strange reconnected his hands, his thumbs parallel to each other with his other fingers spread wide open. He rotated them clockwise, like a key being turned in a lock, and a resplendently emerald pattern appeared before his hands. Strange pulled one of his hands back, and the pattern was pulled along with it, coating his other arm like a bracer of slowly swirling emerald energy. Izuku could only stare, fascinated at the intricate display before him. Strange took a step back, allowing the green radiance from the amulet to illuminate the ruined breakfast on the floor. He slowly waved his hand across the air to his right, the swirling pattern adorned on his arm layers upon layers of squares, and circles intricately placed within each other moving in tandem with him. Izuka could hardly believe the spectacle he was witnessing. As Strange slid his hand, the fallen tray began rotating again before floating back up. The sausages, and orange slices bounced off the floor a couple times and returned to their place atop the tray. The spilled rice was seemingly pulled back into the bowl, and the puddle of milk was sucked back into the now straightened and unperturbed carton. Izuka sat, dumbfounded, and blinking, at the fully restored breakfast tray before him, still fresh and steaming, as if it were none the wiser of its plummet to the floor. Breakfast, Strange said while dispelling the green energy, the amulet closing shut tightly, as well, is served. Izuka didn't immediately respond. He sat still, looking up at Strange in awe for what had to have been several minutes, though the clock still read 9.10 a.m. Dr. Strange, Izuka finally managed to speak, a hint of excitement in his voice. I've never seen a quirk like that before. Strange bowed, as if he had given an elaborately staged performance, which, of course, it was, and the performance had only just begun. You flatter me, young man, Strange said with thinly veiled amusement, though I must inform you that what you just saw was not caused by any quirk. What? was all Izuka could utter before Dr. Strange began levitating cross-legged above the end of his bed. Your quirk is levitation, Izuka said with a slack-jawed expression. Strange shook his head. Not levitation, no. Strange flicked his index and middle fingers up, a chunk of the rice floating out of the bowl and toward Midoriya's mouth. The boy winced as he was suddenly reminded of the deplorable state of his hands, preventing him from eating without assistance. Telekinesis, then? Izuka asked with a little less enthusiasm. Wrong again, Strange said with an unreadable tone and expression. Eat. Izuka grumbled something indiscernible before reluctantly taking the floating ball of rice into his mouth and immediately struggling to swallow it down. Hot, hot, how is this rice still this hot? Strange was openly grinning now, and Izuka found the open carton of milk floating daintily in his face. Izuka latched onto it with his lips and quickly slurped it down, panting, as the scorching hot rice was washed down with it. Care for some more? Strange asked mildly, giving another wave of his fingers that was far more complex for Izuku to follow this time. More, Izuku was about to ask before he felt a sloshing against his lips. The milk carton was completely refilled. Izuku released it from his mouth and pulled his head back in shock. The carton simply floated back down, resting lifelessly once again on the plastic tray. Do you not like oranges? Strange playfully inquired. Perhaps you would prefer something else, like Strange moving his fingers up and down in a circular motion a dazzling orange energy sprouting from his fingertips, and opening up in a rift which Strange calmly reached into, pulling out a bunch of bananas to show Izuku. Izuku simply sat in stunned, perpetual silence. Or perhaps you're more a fan of. Stop, Izuku finally shouted. Strange, and Izuku stared long, and hard at one another. Strange was studying Izuku's eyes intently. There was no apprehension or even excitement in those green eyes of his, only a desire for a demand for answers. Strange inwardly smiled, pleased by what he saw. Who? Izuku started to ask before closing his lips, 
searching for a better word. What are you? Strange didn't miss a beat. I am Dr. Stephen Strange, master of the mystic arts, sorcerer supreme over this reality. Everything you've seen, and everything I've done was, and is, achieved through the use of the ambient energies that flow through, and around everything in this dimension, as well as every other dimension in the multiverse. I rely solely on this mystical knowledge, for I, like you, possess no quirk. The air became fraught with tension, laying thickly by the growing silence between Izuku and Strange. Izuku had lowered his head, as Strange explained himself honestly and earnestly, his curly green bangs covering his eyes. You don't have to lie, you know, Izuku whispered, eliciting a deep frown from Strange. You don't have to make stuff up just to try and make me feel better, young man I assure you. How could you even say all of that with a straight face? Izuku suddenly exploded in anger and tears, glaring daggers at the levitating Strange. You already know I'm quirkless. My hands are shaking and ruined. I can't even eat on my own. And now you're telling me you're telling me that you're quirkless despite having so many abilities. Strange was still, silent, and frowning. As Izuka laid bare his heart, and the frustrations, and bitterness that had enraptured him so thoroughly during his stay in the hospital. I don't want to hear any of that, he shrieked. Yes I do doubt I don't want to be told that a quirkless loser like me can have that kind of power. Yes I do. I don't need you feeling sorry for me. Please help me. Izuka raised his shaky hand, struggling to keep his fingers curled, as he pointed at Strange accusingly. I don't need your pity. Strange suddenly dove toward him, his movements almost too fast for Izuka to perceive. Izuka glanced down just as Strange thrust his hand into his chest and yanked him upward, sending him soaring into the air, except he was floating instead. Listlessly Izuka watched in confusion, as he felt himself floating closer and closer to the clock on the wall. 9.10 am the clock said mockingly. What just happened? Izuka asked aloud before reaching out to stop himself from floating into the wall, only to stare at his glowing, transparent arms with a mixture of amazement and horror. Izuka turned his head toward the blank television screen next to the clock, taking in his reflection. His entire body was floating, entirely transparent, and emanating a golden, wispy luster that rolled off this ethereal form of his like waves at the beach. He looked into the reflection and saw behind him, too, Doctor Strange, floating above his body? His body was still lying, wide-eyed, and motionless. On his bed, he saw Strange curl his fingers back downward, and then felt himself being forcibly sucked back down. Izuka blinked, as he jolted in bed, his heart beating in his ears, as he panted loudly, struggling to catch his breath, and simultaneously go over what just happened. What did you just do? Izuka demanded. I merely pulled your astral form out of your body for a few moments, Strange replied plainly. Izuka grit his teeth in frustration as a fresh batch of tears peeked out of his ducts. This again. Why are you doing this to me? Izuka pleaded. Why are you showing me all this? To show you that your dreams aren't ruined just because your hands are. Strange whispered, placing his hands above Izuka's face. And to show you that power is never beyond your grasp. His hands. It can't be. Izuka thought in stunned disbelief. Izuka had initially thought the doctor's hands to be wrinkled and callous. But no, they were indeed covered with scars, like his were. They faded with time and were not nearly as pronounced as his freshly rented hands, but they were scarred nonetheless. Open your eyes, Strange uttered, placing his thumb on Izuka's forehead. Izuka's breath caught, he stared gaping, as the room seemed to twist and stretch beyond recognition, and Strange sent him propelling through the window with a violent crash. Izuka felt his body spinning wildly out of control in a sea of shattered shards after being sent careening through the window. He screamed in fright, trying to protect his face from the glass splinters as he plummeted toward the ground. That is, until Izuka looked down, and saw himself careening away from the earth and into the abysmal vastness of space, with naught but the surrounding stars keeping him company. Am I falling up? This isn't real, Izuka shrieked as he barreled through the howling void. This isn't real, this isn't real, this isn't real, this isn't real? Izuka's acceleration crawled to a sudden halt as an all-might bobblehead figure floated by. Incredulous, Izuka reached out, pushing the head away, only to be violently sent flying in a different direction as the head snapped back. Izuka's screams returned, the space before, and around him twisting, and contorting into a convulsively swirling maelstrom of sights, and sounds, colors, and energies, amalgamations of which Izuka could hardly begin to comprehend. You think your lot in life is predestined? Izuka heard Strange's voice echoing in his ear, the tempest of loud colors, and brightly lit sounds enveloping his body, consuming him, rendering his very being little more than a crusty pace before the frenzied vortex, snapping him back whole as he crashed through the singularity. You think powerlessness is your inevitable fate? Strange's voice echoed again, as Izuka soared through a never-ending deluge of frigid, misty tendrils of fire, and charred, 
smoldering waves threatening to scald him with every scorched splash. The damp fires and blazing waters collided, erupting into a miasmic whirlpool of solid steam, pulling Izuku in deeper, deeper, deeper. At the root of existence, where mind and matter meet, strength can be gleaned and grass strange echoed yet again such strength is off limits to no one not even you izuka rocketed through the steam and into a pulsating corridor of which an endless number of gnarled gray hands shot out of the pulsing mass grabbing him all over and disintegrating his body upon touch a flurry of ashes izuka was swallowed into the throbbing mass falling further and further along as the turbulent energies reconstructed and deconstructed his form repeatedly will you succumb to the temptations of power Strange voice asked, or will your selfless disposition persevere in the wake of your boundless prowess and potential? The raging spectrum spit Izuku's body out distastefully, sending him spinning through an endless kaleidoscopic sea of enormous diamonds, shifting and writhing in limbo as their razor-sharp edges shimmered in the distortion. Izuku braced for a painful skewering, but bounced harmlessly off one gelatinous gem and shattered through another, swirling once more down the ethereal drain. In the infinite vastness of the multiverse, Izuku, powerlessness is chosen. Izuku winced as the vortex drew narrower and tighter, brighter and louder, closer and closer. With a final yell, Izuku burst through the shining veil at the end of the astral corridor, stopping only as his body crashed onto his hospital bed. Izuku, shaken beyond belief, ran his trembling hands all over himself and his bed to confirm he had indeed returned to his world. So Izuku, Doctor Strange, still levitating in the exact same spot above the bed, said, What do you choose? A disheveled, and thunderstruck Izuku forced his shaken body onto his knees, looking up at the Sorcerer Supreme with bewilderment, as his tears flowed freely. Please, Izuku said, daring to hope once more. Teach me. I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. Inko whispered frantically to herself, racing, as fast as she could through the maze of marble white halls and reflective floors and panels of the hospital. She moved, as if she were a fleet of foot, in spite of her rather diminutive stature, through throngs of doctors, nurses, patients, and visitors alike. Third floor. Room 313 she mumbled to herself, choosing to dart between two conversing nurses rather than be slowed down, uttering hurried apologies, as she passed right on by. Inko clutched a tightly wrapped plastic bag to her chest, the textile contents jostling with every hurried step. 10 past 9. She hadn't meant to be late. She hadn't anticipated being held up in the lobby. Inko silently hoped her baby boy's breakfast hadn't cooled off by the time she got there. It would have seemed cruel telling a nurse to deliver food to her son that he couldn't eat on his own with the expectation that she would be there on time to help feed him, and then turn around, and be late herself. Izuku already had crushed hands, and dreams, to worry about. Inko certainly didn't want her son to think for even a second that she would seem negligible when he needed her now more than ever. Room 311, Room 312, Room 313. Inko burst into her son's hospital room, and it was honestly difficult to take everything in all at once. A tray of assorted breakfast foods lay unceremoniously scattered across the tile floor. Her precious son was in his bed, and on his knees, openly weeping to be taught by the man who had rescued him, Dr. Strange. She remembered the gentleman introducing himself, as to her, and said gentleman was levitating while cross-legged by the foot of Izuka's bed. But even with all of that to take in, Inko still found her attention drifting to the barrage of sensations cascading around her body. The entire room felt incredibly energized for some indiscernible reason, as nothing seemed out of place or off besides Izuku, strange, and the spilled food. Inko could only stare wide-eyed at the other two occupants of the room, as the bag of fresh clothes she had brought up for her son threatened to slip out of her previously iron-tight grasp. For a moment, the two Midorias and Strange could only stare at each other, with one looking frantic, another looking particularly overwrought, and the other looking surprised, but not at all displeased. Small wonder that Izuku, Strange, and herself suddenly began talking at once, with Strange greeting her, and apologizing for causing yet another mess on the floor, Izuku yelling out for his mother while waving his arms, and Inko calling back to Izuku frantically before reciprocating Strange's greeting with a soft tone. Naturally, both Inko and Strange gave deference to Izuku, allowing him to have his say first. However, Mom, Izuku shouted, and Inko felt her heart crack what sounded like renewed hope. I can still become a hero. What tightness Inko had in her grip finally gave way to slack, and the bag of clothes she was carrying dropped to the floor with a soft rustle. Dr. Strange told me. Izuka motioned toward the still levitating man with his scarred hand, though Izuka hardly seemed to care at the moment. He can teach me magic even though I'm quirkless. Inko's wide eyes followed Izuka's hand in the direction of Strange, who said nothing, as Izuka raved about how his dream hadn't died after all. No, Strange was instead looking over at Inko in an almost contemplative manner, 
as if he were gauging her reaction to her son's sudden dropping of that bombshell of information. And there was this maelstrom of fire, water, and steam. No Inko inwardly quivered. Strange lips twitched, his eyes as gentle, but firm, as they were boring straight through her, as if she were perfectly transparent, feelings, and all. And there were these crystals, but they were made of jelly I think. Just how much more hope can you stand to endure, Izuku? Inko despaired. And I was even flying through space. And, Izuku, Inko suddenly yelled out, interrupting the boy's excited rantings. She took in a deep breath, composing all her motherly thoughts and feelings as best she could while leaning down to retrieve the bag of fresh clothes. Take these clean clothes into the restroom and get changed. Izuku was startled by her sudden interruption, but he shakily accepted the bag without any arguing or retorts of any kind. He slowly shambled into the adjacent restroom, giving his mother and Strange one final look of dejection before shutting the door. Even after that, Strange said nothing still, continuing instead his studious analysis of Inko, as she stared right back, though with far less confidence. Dr. Strange, Inko began, I will be forever grateful that you saved my son's life, but it's irresponsible to give him false hope like that. Inko felt something akin to a phantom gut punch, as the words exited her mouth. It may have seemed a callous thing to say, but she remembered quite clearly her son from nearly ten years ago. How hopeful he was at getting his very own quirk, and how it would undoubtedly set him on the path to being just like his idol, All Might. But she saw his tears, and heard his despondent sobs even more clearly. How shattered her son was to learn he never exhibit a quirk of his own, all because of something, as seemingly trivial, as a toe joint, and how shattered she was to understand that there was little she could do about it. As much as she treasured her son didn't he deserve something better than constantly crush dreams? I understand the dangers that can be posed by dreams, Strange said after an additional moment of silence. His mind wandered to that ethereal entity dubbed Nightmare who he has clashed with on numerous occasions over the years. But I also see how Azuka's dreams have molded him into the pure-hearted young man that he is today, and I know that you see that as well. I wish to teach him and nourish those dreams, and that heart of his. You offered to teach him magic? Inko inquired, her voice laced with skepticism, as she wrung her hands together out of discomfort. I understand your reluctance to lend any sort of credence to the existence of those things considered mystical and arcane, Strange said, casually conjuring two floating teacups and saucers in midair with a wave of his fingers. Such skepticism is to be expected when one has been a sorcerer for as long as I have. T. Inko could only gape in astonishment as the diminutive teacups materialized out of thin air, hovering daintily above strange outstretched hands, whirling around where it floated, as if for additional effect. No, it hadn't simply appeared, Inko thought. It was as if the space around the strange doctor's hands had actually warped, and the teacups had merely slipped through the cracks, for lack of a better description. Inko could only blink, as one of the teacups gently levitated over to her within grasping distance. She reached up and accepted it, despite her mind still racing through countless thoughts and possibilities. Only when she accepted the cup and saucer, and it started jittering in place did she realize that her hands were even shaking at all. Doctor, there's no tea in here, Inko said lightly. An obtuse oversight on my part, Strange said with just the barest hint of a knowing smirk gracing his lips. One snap of his fingers later, and Inko was staring down in amazement, as steam billowed from the bottom of the cup, followed by the pooling of a dark liquid that steadily rose until the cup was filled. The steam wafted into her nostrils invitingly, and Inko took a quick sip for herself, if only to ensure the brew wasn't some illusion cast by the strange doctor. It has a dense consistency, yet it's delicious, Inko said before taking another sip. Strange offered a quiet chuckle. Your son had a very adverse reaction to that very same tea. I hardly blame him, though. Tibetan butter tea can be quite the acquired taste. Strange sipped out of his own teacup, and gave another intricate wave of his fingers, allowing both cups to refill with brew anew. Inko was certainly bedazzled by Strange's display of tricks. Is all this you must be using your quirk to do all of this, correct? Inko asked after another sip. The words had come out almost instinctively. After all, how could any ability in this power-riddled world of theirs not be the byproduct of some quirk? And yet the back of her mind was being nipped at by the voice of her own doubts that none of this was caused by a quirk. The doctor's levitation, his conjuring of teacups, the materializing of tea from seemingly thin air, none of it seemed related. She did not have the superb analytical skills regarding quirks and powers that her son possessed and could not think of any correlation between any of strange tricks. Magic, her voice of doubt reasoned. A lot to take in, isn't it? Strange said softly as his body drifted downwards, his legs stretching out to meet the ground, as he resumed a standing position, though the teacups remained floating. Most people in the world are so entrenched into a reality instilled by quirks that they fail to realize or even entertain the possibility of there being so much more. Strange extended his hand out, as both fire 
and electricity consumed it. The fire spun wildly around his open palm before leaping off and covering the room's walls in its erratic, fiery dance. The lightning zipped between his fingertips before ultimately leaping up onto the ceiling, coating it in a dazzling array of blue sparks. Inko was rooted where she stood out of fear and reverence for the sudden showing of power. Another simple snap of strange fingers, and it had all faded away. No more heat, no more light, and most impressively of all, there was no damage to any of the walls or the ceiling. Inko felt her legs shaking, and she found herself suddenly sitting on the edge of Izuka's bed before she could even register any sensation of either falling or being whisked to safety by Strange. These magic abilities, Inko said while keeping her eyes glued to the floor. If Izuka were to have these powers, he could pass, as having an actual quirk of his own. Could he not? What is this feeling? I cannot deny that it would indeed be somewhat similar, Strange said after pondering her question for a moment. Though his skills will not be particularly distinctive from anyone else who is the least bit proficient in the mystic arts. This spark I'm feeling is this hope? If you were to train him, could he become strong? Inko blurted out, as she tried to contain a great surging of emotion welling up behind her eyes. Izuku, can I bear the burden of hope like you have for all these years? Undoubtedly so, Strange replied. Given his young age, he could even come to surpass my own skills with enough training. Then he can become a hero with magic? A few droplets fell down her cheeks and to the floor before Inko tearfully looked back up at Strange. It's Azuka's dream to become a hero like All Might, but he doesn't have a quirk of his own to help him get there. For nearly 10 years I've been unable to help my son achieve the life that he wants. So please. Inko shocked the doctor by falling to the floor, bowing to Strange almost reverently. Please teach Izuku. Teach him to become a hero. Strange looked on his expression undecipherable yet erudite in his ponderings. He offered Inko a gentle hand and helped her back up, allowing her to regain her composure and to take her spot back on the edge of the bed before speaking. It is beyond my power to teach Izuku on how to become a hero. Strange raised his hand to prevent Inko from interrupting, and he continued, I am offering to train your son in the skills of the mystic arts so that he might have more than enough power to help realize his dream. But whether or not he actually attains this goal will be entirely up to him and him alone. Strange offered a knowing smile to reassure the boy's mother. I've placed my faith in the boy to use the power I have to offer for good, and I can see you, too, are not bereft of hope for your son, and I would not dare attempt to train him without his guardian's express permission, which I can see you are also willing to give. Let's bring Izuka back in here, shall we? Strange asked among a chorus of sniffles, and thanks from the depleted woman. Strange made his way over to the bathroom door wrapping his knuckles against the wooden frame with a series of quick knocks. He heard an eep on the other side before the door swung open, and a rather sheepish-looking Izuka stepped out. He was sporting a gray shirt, and green sweatpants clothes easy enough for him to slip into given the state of his hands. Was he listening in on the conversation? Strange thought to himself, as he noticed how flustered Izuka looked, as if he was about to explode with exuberance. So, Izuka began, his hands shaking from possibly, as much excitement, as nerve damage for now. Are you going to train me? Strange grinned, and planted a hand onto Izuka's green mop of hair, ruffling him gently. As of this moment, we are master and student, young Midoriya. Izuka's whole body shook, and he opened his mouth to cry, but not before his mother slammed into him, embracing her son and the mother of all hugs, as they both sobbed joyously, leaving Strange the sole witness to the uncanny deluge of waterworks that seemed to be par for the course for the Midoriya family. After several minutes of sobs, hiccups, pats, and the passing around of handkerchiefs by Strange, Inko finally managed to pull herself away from her son. Oh, Izuku, Inko choked out, as her sobs finally subsided. This was sent to the apartment yesterday. I thought it best to bring it here rather than leave it there. Inko slipped a hand into her handbag, and procured a shiny card. Izuku reached out to take it, but stopped short given his hands. Can you? Izuku left his question hanging in the air, but Strange understood what he wanted. Izuku still hadn't completely come to terms with his still unusable hands, and the sorcerer doubted he would until his training produced results. Say no more, Izuku, Strange replied, and levitated the card before the boy so he could read it without impediment. Izuku's eyes scanned the card, growing more and more wide, as he took its contents in. It was a get well soon card that was signed the Bakuga family in big, bright calligraphic letters. It was bright, colorful, not at all mundane and bland like the cards sent in by the rest of his classmates. And at the very end of the card were several giant explosion stickers slapped on. Only one person from the family could have done that. Kaken, he did care. Since we're in the middle of sharing cards, Strange spoke up, as Izuku was gushing over Bakugo's gift. I have one of my own to give. A small card, business-like in size, appeared with a flick of his wrist, which he handed promptly to Inko. What is this? Inko asked, as she gave it a look over. One side was bare except for a strange symbol, 
It was a circle with a series of four swooping lines in its interior. The back side of the card had a tea recipe printed on it. With this card, you may get into contact with me, Strange informed. Running your finger clockwise along the circle will alert me to your location. If you need to convey a verbal message, run your finger counterclockwise along the circle, then speak into the card. And the tea recipe on the back is for? The butter tea that you sampled earlier, Strange said with a smile. During his training, Izuku may have to go into deep meditation. You can use that tea to pull him out of his meditation if you need to. Does the tea contain magical properties? Inko asked. Oh no, Strange said, leaning in close to whisper to Inko. Your son just absolutely abhors the stuff. Izuku, I know you're excited, but please calm down a moment. Inko called after her son who was positively bounding all around the apartment the next day. Given the nature of his injuries, Inko had managed to procure time off for her son until the beginning of the following school week, more than enough time for him to get acquainted with whatever training regimen Dr. Strange had in store for him. As much as I would like to jump straight into using lightning or fire spells, it's far more likely he'll start me off small with something akin to his levitation before anything else, and then I can move on to more practical uses of Azuka mumbled on, as he paced around his abode excitedly, his exasperated mother watching on helplessly as her son engaged in monologue with himself. Deciding not to interrupt his deep murmurings, Inko pulled out the card Strange had left her with, remembering his instructions. I will come by tomorrow to give you both a cursory tour of my personal sanctum, Inko recalled Strange's words. I think it would be both beneficial and fair for you to see where I will be training your son. For now, though, allow yourselves to rest with what remains of the day. Inko hadn't any time to respond before the space before Strange split apart and opened up in a swirling mass of energy directed by Strange's very hands. Strange offered one last gentlemanly bow before stepping through, the portal closing behind him, leaving an even further stunned mother, and one overjoyed teenager. And rest they certainly had. After finalizing Izuka's release from the hospital, Inko drove herself, and Izuka back home where they promptly crashed, no doubt exhausted by all that had transpired that morning. By the next day, they were fully rested, and dressed presentably, though Izuka squirmed quite a bit as he needed his mother's help to get fully dressed. Inko ran her thumb clockwise along the edge of the circle on Strange's card. Almost immediately, a portal sprang into being in the middle of the apartment, and Strange strolled into their living room, red cloak, and all. Very quaint, Strange said with a small smile, as he took in Midoriya's abode. You'll have to invite me over for tea one day. But for now, he glanced over at Izuku who was still muttering to himself at the table. Izuku, are you ready? Yes, Dr. Strange. Or should I call you Sensei now? That's not too much, is it? I hope that's okay. Sensei, I'm ready to begin. Izuka stammered profusely, as he snapped back to attention, bowing his head low, to which Strange reassured the boy, as best he could. As Strange assured her son that calling him Sensei would be no trouble, though may be too formal for his American sensibilities, Inko peered into the portal Strange had opened up. Beyond the shimmering veil appeared to be a forest? It didn't seem all too bizarre in hindsight, Inko thought since Strange seemed like a very private man who would need to practice his seemingly arcane abilities away from the prying eyes of the general public. She just hoped he didn't actually live out here. Ladies first, Strange said politely, extending his arms toward the portal and inviting Inko to step on through. Inko did after a moment's hesitation. She tried to crouch through so as to avoid touching any of that blazing energy that the portal seemed to be made of. She landed on a squishy bed of moss as she abandoned the air-conditioned comfort of her home for the muggy warmth of the surrounding forest, followed closely by Strange and Izuku. And behind us is my own abode, Strange spoke, dispelling the portal, as the Midorias turned around only to yell out in shock, though both did for very different reasons. He lives in such a dilapidated building, Inko internally shrieked. He lives in the mansion Kaken had me sneak into, Izuku internally wailed. Indeed, the building before them was the very same building Izuku had snuck into, and explored briefly that fateful night, he had lost all functioning use of his hands. Izuka visibly wilted. He couldn't let his mother know what he had been roped into doing, and he was most certainly praying that his new sensei wouldn't spill the beans either. Its appearance is indeed shocking, but I assure you, it's entirely intentional, Strange informed them. As Inko turned and looked at him questioningly, he elaborated. The ruined building you see before you is merely an illusory spell cast to ward off any would-be intruders. The illusion affects even the interior so even those who step inside will not be privy to the true appearance and secrets of the sanctum. At this, he cast a knowing look toward Izuku, who shrank sheepishly under his gaze. The sanctum? Inko asked. Yes, the sanctum sanctorum, as it's known among the practitioners of the mystic arts, Strange replied. This is one of three in the world, and the one I personally preside over. Its location here is temporary it is usually located in New York. He moved an entire building from New York to Japan. 
Izuka thought before immediately berating himself for even being surprised. Of course he could do something like that. Standing back a moment, Strange instructed the Midorias, as he stepped toward the ruined mansion, hands stretched out. As he parted his hands in an arcane movement, a sudden rumbling echoed from the house. The structure began to shake, as if roused from a deep slumber. To Izuku and Inko's amazement, the building seemed to stretch and flex, as the peeled off wooden beams miraculously snapped back into place. The holes in the roof seemed to patch themselves whole, and the flaked off paint re-emerged with a brand new coat of mahogany and brown. The mansion then stretched upward, and where there were once two stories, now there were three, sporting pristine window panes. The third floor sported a giant window pane that was circular with four swooping lines, an identical symbol to that on the card Strange gave Inko. Let us tarry no longer, shall we? Strange asked in a nonchalant tone, as he strode toward his mansion, leaving mother and son to collectively shelve their continued amazement of the doctor so they could catch up. The architecture isn't anything I've ever seen, Izuka gawked to himself, as Strange stepped aside, allowing his guests to enter first. But he did say it was from New York, after all. Izuku and Inko removed their shoes at the door cultural norms and whatnot despite Strange urging them that it would fine regardless, and looked around the foyer with bewilderment. Intricately tiled floors, luxuriant frames adorning the walls featuring landscapes completely unrecognizable to Izuku furniture of a most ostentatious sort, and a number of relics on pedestals and behind glass cases alike. The grand staircase filled in the wider-than-expected room quite nicely, and the arched doorways flanking the staircase seemed to house living and dining room areas respectively. My my, Dr. Strange, Inko said bemusedly, this is all quite a bit, and this is only the first floor, Izuku added, as he perused the various artifacts in the room, though he made sure not to touch any of them. It never truly ceases to amaze me either. Strange admitted with a nod. My position as Sorcerer Supreme has blessed me with many privileges while also burdening me with many responsibilities, the protection of the many relics here being one of them. Izuka flinched away from a cauldron, fearful of causing any damage, before being led to the second floor by Strange. What's down that hallway? Inko inquired while pointing toward a room filled with many shimmering panels, Strange said, his eyes gleaming with fondness, as he led the Midoriya toward the end of the hall. Is the rotunda of gateways. What is this? Izuka asked aloud as his gaze drifted from window to window. Each window in the round room depicted a different environment of sorts, ranging from desert to jungle. The rotunda can be used to open a direct portal to wherever the window is showing, Strange informed them. So what we're seeing right now is, correct, Strange nodded. Every environment depicted is an actual location somewhere on the planet that you can travel to via this device. Not only that, Strange placed his hand on a dial protruding from the wall, and gave it a spin, seemingly taking the rest of the room with it. When Inko, and Izuku regained their bearings, they saw that each window was now displaying a different location. Some were urban this time, too. You can manipulate the location of each portal, Izuku shouted out, as he became more and more filled with excitement. Indeed, Strange said with a knowing smile, with the rotunda one can appear virtually anywhere one desires, whether it be this world or another. Izuku nearly felt his knees buckle when Strange gave the room another spin, and he was suddenly gazing at the gates of Yudata high through the window in front of him. This world or another? Inko asked dubiously. Are you saying you can use this room to travel to other dimensions? Strange interjected. Yes, you can. Other dimensions. Izuka's eyes widened in sheer delight. Can you show me? Not now. Strange's voice clipped with an uncharacteristically morose tone. He quickly regained his composure and took a deep breath, turning to face Izuka with a more reassuring smile. When you are deemed ready, you will be permitted to use the rotunda in such a way. Let us continue. And so the tour continued, with a brief look into the various living quarters and the several library and study rooms dotting the interior of the sanctum. Izuku absorbed everything in the same studious manner he did for heroes and their quirks, and while Inko was receptive to what Strange was showing them, she still found herself lingering on that sudden change in tone he had in the rotunda. Dr. Strange, Inko, suddenly called out to him as they descended the staircase back into the foyer. These sessions you're going to put my son through will they be dangerous? Strange was giving her a firm stare as he pondered her question for, but a moment. I will not lie to you, ma'am, he said. Devoting oneself to studying the ways of the mystic arts will never be without risk to a practitioner, even if said risk is usually marginal or negligible. He took a step toward her and gave a deep bow. But I swear on my life that I will keep your son safe while he remains under my tutelage. Please raise your head, Inko stammered, feeling a bit ashamed, as she thought she may have come across more dubious and offensive than she had intended. You've already saved my son's life once. I more than trust you to keep him out of harm's way, doctor. You have my word, Strange reiterated, as he regained his posture, looking between the relief on Inko's face and the barely constrained enthusiasm on Izuku's. Izuku, Strange called out to his new student, 
Yes, sir. Izuku snapped back to attention and stood up straight. Do you know what today is? Strange asked. Ah, Izuku blinked. The date? Today is August the 26th, Strange said matter-of-factly. The entrance exam you'll be eligible for takes place in exactly 18 months. I assume you'll want to begin as soon as possible, yes? Izuka nodded furiously. I see, Strange said with a smirk. Then we shall begin post-haste. Izuka fidgeted with his clothes as his mother helped him slip into his training uniform. He was oddly silent, staring into the mirror intently, taking in the tunic he had been granted by Strange his new sensei. His tunic was completely white marking him as the rank of novice, as Strange put it, and flowing briskly whenever he fidgeted. It felt and moved comfortably, and it breathed. All in all, the tunic felt pleasant to wear. You look dashing, Inko cried, interrupting Izuku's musings with the sudden flash and click of a camera. Your first day of training, I'll need as many pictures as I can take for this. Oh, just imagine the scrapbook years from now. Mom, please. Izuku's face flushed red, and he promptly turned away, hiding his face in his trembling hands. I'm ready, so we should call Sensei here while it's still early. And early it still was. The sun had just barely peeked over the horizon, and with all the buildings surrounding their apartment, the sky still glowed in vibrant, iridescent hues of red and yellow, as the sun itself was not yet visible. Izuka thought back to his sensei's explanation of what their first training sessions would entail. They were to be longer than the lessons Izuka would come to expect while school was in effect. Izuka still had two more days before he returned to school to resume classes on a normal schedule again. But Strange had planned to use those two days to the best of his ability, covering as much of the basics for his new student while laying out the foundation of what would become his training regimen. Of course, none of this training shall take precedence over your regular schoolwork, Izuku recalled Strange saying. You'll need to remain diligent, as a student at school, as well, Izuku. Inko certainly snapped to attention at that, assuring the doctor that she would not allow her son to falter when it came to grades, eliciting a small smile from Strange. I know, I know. Inko pulled her son's attention back to the present for the second time that morning. It's just training. Magic. This is all so new for you. And also me. I can't even imagine. Izuka cupped his mother's cheeks. Mom, I'm excited too. I'm more excited than I've been about any other day in my life. Now let's call Strange before I literally choke on this excitement. Inko nodded and fetched her purse, rummaging through it to retrieve the calling card Strange had gifted her. She ran her fingers clockwise along the edge of the symbol, as instructed. And a good morning to the both of you, Strange's voice echoed through the living room. A bright swirling flame sparked into existence opening up the fiery portal with which Strange walked through, decked in his usual attire. Sensei, I'm ready to begin, Izuka said offering, as formal of a bow, as he could muster. Cordial to a fault, Strange thought, as he turned his attention to Izuku. The flowing white robes of the novice, Strange remarked on the attire he had gifted the boy. Hopefully by the end of next summer you will have instead the crimson robes of the apprentice. I will have your son return home with his expectations of training and assignments before sundown. Strange spoke to Inko before motioning for Izuku to follow him back through the portal and into the sanctum. Izuku stepped toward the portal, his mother tearfully waving him off from behind, and his new sensei watching him expectantly from the other side. He paused momentarily. He balled his trembling hands into fists. This is it, Izuku thought, determination flooding his mind and spirit. Stepping through this portal will be like my first step toward becoming a hero. And step through he did, only to have his view obstructed by a floating tray carrying biscuits and tea, with a nonchalant strange speaking on the necessity of breakfast. To make matters worse, it was that damn Tibetan butter tea again. Izuka blanched. Not a good start for a first step. As with any field requiring study and practice, Strange spoke to his student. It is essential to start with the theoretical before transitioning into the practical. As contradictory as it may sound, magic like any science must be studied to be understood. And more importantly, it must be studied to be controlled. Strange sat cross-legged on the floor of the second floor study, with Izuka sitting on his knees across from him, nodding his head, as he took in everything Strange had to say. A studious mind, Strange noted. Good. He'll need it for what's to come. If it suits your fancy, Strange continued. You may also view magic as a language, one that has existed since the dawn of civilization and long before the emergence of the powers we call quirks. The use of this language has traditionally been called spellcasting since the days of the ancient masters, Strange went on, weaving his hands through the air, and conjuring lines of dazzling energy from the tips of his fingers. Though if you prefer a more contemporary description magic can be likened to a program, it is the source code that forms the foundation of our reality. The energy began taking shape, as Strange talked, linking, and chaining into an intricate mandala design before Izuka's eyes. Sorcerers harness this energy from our universe and from other dimensions to weave spells into existence, to conjure shields and weapons to our aid, 
to make magic. Strange flicked his hands towards his student, and the mandala he had constructed so exquisitely rumbled, as its energy was released in Izuku's face engulfing him in a shower of fizzling embers and ethereal warmth. Izuka released a breath he hadn't realized he was even holding in. These displays of magic that he'd been audience to never cease to amaze him. He glanced at strange hands, the faded scars being nearly indiscernible from wizened, callous age, and hard work, and traced his eyes down to his own quivering palms, the scars still fresh, and startlingly visible, and apparent. Even if I tried to do what you just did, Izuka said after collecting his thoughts, my hands would just be waving around in the air. How do I get from here? He motioned to the white tunic symbolizing his blatant inexperience. To where you are now? It's, as I said Izuku, Strange responded. Study and practice. Before I was a sorcerer, I was a surgeon, and I would have given the same answer to anyone desiring to follow in my footsteps. Given enough time and dedication, there will be nothing you cannot reshape using the energies within you or the different energies around you. Different energies? Izuka blinked in confusion. There are three different energies that can be used in magic, Strange said while holding up three fingers. The first are the personal energies, energy that is derived from a sorcerer's life force. This kind of energy can be used to develop mental powers such as the astral projection technique I showed you back in the hospital. Izuka recalled clearly having his astral body ripped from his physical body by Strange when he was displaying his power. However, Strange intoned warningly, constant use of one's personal energies can prove fatal even to the most skilled master of magic. Therefore, it is necessary for sorcerers to learn to harness external energies through meditation and training so that we may use magic without posing any unnecessary harm unto ourselves. Izuka gulped. Strange did say that there was always a risk when studying the arcane. After all, one of these energies that can be harnessed and the one that we will be working on the most to train you in are the universal energies, Strange said gesturing to Izuku, and then the entire room. These are the energies that flow all around our world and around ourselves. Even at this very moment, our bodies are surrounded by an infinite amount of pure energy that one only needs to grasp in order to use. At that, Strange reached out, and clenched his hand in thin air, as if grasping the hem of a fabric, and pulled. It was barely visible to Izuka's eyes, but he still managed to make out a thin sheen of light that became more apparent, as Strange balled the energy up into a sphere. Strange inspected the glowing globe he had whisked into existence, and promptly let it go, watching his students in trance face with amusement as the globe dissolved into a multitude of fading white specks. It is with the universal energies that the majority of your spellcasting will come from, Strange said. The majority? Izuka picked up on his word choice right away. There's another type of energy that can be used, right? You said there were three kinds. That I did, my pupil, Strange replied, his grin faltering enough for Izuka to notice. The third energy, dimensional energies. These are energies derived from other dimensions rather than our own, and also from the entities that dwell there. Izuku couldn't shake the feeling that his sensei was alluding to something grim. Entities? Izuku. Strange spoke with a deathly seriousness. I have no intention of teaching you how to harness dimensional energies. Not until you reach the rank of disciple, that is. Dealing with forces that exist outside of our natural universe can open oneself to a host of otherworldly influences and corruption. I understand, Izuku said with a solemn nod. Dimensional energies aside, training in the personal, and universal energies should be enough to flesh out your magical repertoire by the time the entrance exam rolls around. Strange moved the conversation along a bit quickly, possibly to put the tension he had just laid out to rest. Izuka wasn't going to push the issue of dimensional energies. He figured he would cross that bridge when he got there. I've got there. My repertoire? Izuka asked aloud. Just how many skills can be used through the use of magic? Where to even begin? Strange scoffed. Astral projection, divination, spell casting, portals, transmutation the list goes on and on. You've already seen firsthand the versatility that magic can grant a practitioner. And you're going to train me in all those skills? Izuku asked incredulously. In time, yes, Strange said, the corners of his lips threatening to curl into a grin. Why not simply train me in one skill at a time until I master it before moving on to the next? Izuku asked. At that, Strange wagged a finger at Izuku. Because a jack of all trades, a master of none is a far better deal than a master of one. Izuka couldn't say that he was a fan of riddles, but he got the gist of Strange's words well enough. It would be more beneficial to show competence, but not mastery over a vast array of skills than to exceed at one skill, and be extremely poor in all others. This was especially true for himself, being quirkless, and whatnot. He was aiming for the UA, and only the best of the best could get into the best school. He would need to develop a diverse skill set if he hoped to stand on equal footing with anyone else skilled enough with their quirk to get into the famed hero course. Kachin Izuka's mind invariably wandered over to Bakugo. He possessed an extremely powerful quirk that seemed suited for heroics no one could deny that. But even Bakugo could likely get into the UA through brute strength alone. Izuka knew his old friend would never rely on just that. Bakugo was smart, 
His grades showed that, and he knew how to be terribly creative with his explosion quirk when he wanted to be. Izuku resolved to be just as creative with his magic if he hoped to surpass him, and aim for the top. Then let's get started, Izuki yelled out, startling Strange with his sudden burst of enthusiasm. Where will I begin first? Strange had to fight a visceral urge to beam a great big smile at his energetic pupil. Now, now, don't get ahead of yourself. We have to start small, which means starting with this. Strange dug his hand into a pocket on the waist of his tunic and pulled out a diminutive item of some sort. Izuku leaned in closer to get a better look. The object appeared simple, with two looped openings that seemed melded together, and with a flat top. It was golden, but extremely dull in color. What is it, Sensei? Izuku inquired. This strange replied, is a sling ring, and it is one of the first steps toward using magic. Thanks for watching my video, and make sure to check out the author of this fanfic. Link is in the description. See you next time. Till then, sayonara.